two additional natural factors affect levels of the Great Lakes, inflow from the upper lake and outflow to the next lower. Michigan and Huron get their water from Lake Superior through the St. Mary's River, which flows out via the St. Clair River near Detroit. Much of the blame for high Lake Michigan water levels, however, is aimed at artificial regulation of the waters flowing in and out of Lake Superior. Much of it is under the jurisdiction of the International Joint Commission, uh, which is set up by a treaty with Canada. And so uh, that is uh, in the domain of, of international affairs. There, there's no law that Congress can pass. The Boundary Waters Treaty, signed by the United States and Canada in 1909, regulates and resolves disputes regarding the two nations' shared use of water. Specifically, it states, diversions which affect the natural level or flow of the Great Lakes shall not be made except by the authority of the United States or the Dominion of Canada and with the approval of the International Joint Commission. Only two of the Great Lakes are regulated by the IJC, Lake Superior and Ontario. Lake Ontario lies below Niagara Falls and has no effect on the upper lakes, so the controversy focuses on Superior. Much of it surrounds the diversion of water from the Albany River Basin into the Great Lakes watershed. In 1939 and 1943, Canada built two diversion dams, with consent from the Roosevelt administration, suggesting that more hydroelectric power might be needed to defeat Hitler's Germany. Two rivers, the Agoki and the Kanogami, were diverted into Lake Nipigon and Long Lock. Power plants were then built on the north shores of Lake Superior, whereas they might not be justifiable in the remote areas along the Albany River. The added water raises Lake Superior by two and a half inches, Lakes Michigan and Huron by four and a half. The rest of the debate zeroes in on the IJC's regulation of Lake Superior's outflow. Since 1916, the Commission has modified the rules several times to obtain improved conditions on the lakes. Currently, Plan 1977, which was generated in large part to high levels in the 70s, is used to determine the outflow from Lake Superior. Its objective is to balance the levels between Superior and Lakes Michigan and Huron, so that maximum benefits are provided to all interests with a minimum of adverse effects to any. This means the level of Lake Superior cannot exceed 602 feet, slightly below its record high level. If it were allowed to exceed 602, extensive damage would occur along the Lake Superior shoreline. However, just because Lake Superior cannot exceed this level should not mean that all the excess be dumped into Lakes Michigan and Huron. That is not a balancing policy. Maybe we should all share in the damage to our shorelines. But something is being done. Last January, the Great Lakes Governor's Task Force called for changes in the structure of the IJC. It seeks a larger and more meaningful role of the states and provinces in discussions between the two federal governments involving the IJC. More immediate action this spring helps stave off even higher levels. In April, Governor Blanchard petitioned Secretary of State George Schultz to seek a halt to the Agoki diversion. Two months later, the Canadians agreed. In addition, the IJC reduced the outflow through the St. Mary's River by one-third. The effect of these two actions dropped the levels of Lakes Michigan and Huron by nearly three inches at the end of September. But in late October, Canada indicated it wanted to resume the Agoki diversion, which prompted Governor Blanchard to reissue his request for a halt. What it boils down to is this. The regulation of Lake Superior will not eliminate the problem of high lake levels. That leaves us with one alternative increased diversion out of the Great Lakes Basin, but that too is frustrated with problems. We'll cover the dilemma of diversion in our next report. I'm George Lessons, TV 13 Eyewitness News. This is the Rising Tides of Frustration, Part 3, for December 18th, and it's a lessons package. The natural outlet for all the upper Great Lakes is through the Niagara River over Niagara Falls. The other outlets are man-made diversions. The Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal and the Calumet Sag Channel direct water from Lake Michigan into the Illinois Waterway and eventually into the Mississippi. The Welland Canal, which is part of the St. Lawrence Seaway system, diverts water around Niagara Falls into Lake Ontario. Much of the debate focuses on increasing the flow of water through these waterways. Some have even suggested building pipelines or canals and shipping the water out west. These are all valid ideas, but ones which may set dangerous precedents. That once they're done, uh, someday might backfire on us in terms of 
we lose our legal precedence to prevent the wholesale exportation of our water. We don't want to get stuck in a situation where suddenly we have uh, other parts of the country bleeding away uh, the water of the Great Lakes in a fashion then that we would not be able to stop. Water flowing out of Lake Erie is controlled by the narrow stretch of the upper Niagara River near Buffalo. 200,000 cubic feet of water flows through this natural bottleneck every second, but only so much water can go through this stretch of the river, the rest backs up into the upper lakes. Some have suggested deepening this five-mile section to increase its capacity, but a study conducted by the International Joint Commission concluded that increasing the flow without the ability to restrict that outflow when needed in times of low water levels would cause immeasurable harm to navigation on the lakes. Nevertheless, on November 12th, Michigan's 18 congressmen petitioned Secretary of State George Shultz, asking that he enlist Canadian support for a new study of how Lake Erie's levels could be regulated, perhaps by even building an additional diversion canal around Niagara Falls. But that would take years. Some minor regulation of the Welland Canal is possible, but the flow cannot change much from the 9,400 cubic feet per second without a major impact on navigation. However, the canal does lower Lakes Michigan and Huron by over two inches a year, offsetting part of the four and a half inch rise contributed by the two Canadian diversions. The only other existing alternative is increased diversion through Chicago. That authority is in, of all places, the United States Supreme Court, and they are the functionary that decides how much they're going to let out. In 1967, after three previous attempts had failed, the U.S. Supreme Court ordered the flow out of Lake Michigan reduced from 10,000 cubic feet per second to no more than 3,200. It was in the early 1960s when the state of Michigan asked the court for a ruling to help keep lake levels from dropping too much at a time when those levels were abnormally low. The court decree did not go into effect until March 1970, but by then the water levels had climbed to normal and have been consistently high ever since. At its present rate, the Chicago Diversion lowers Lakes Michigan and Huron by two and a half inches a year. Added to the Welland Canal outflow, this completely balances the inflow from the Canadian diversions. But why not get the court to rescind its decision? Michigan as a state, uh, having been the original party to the lawsuit that settled in the Supreme Court how much water could go out, had to be the petitioning party to the Supreme Court if there were going to be any changes. But so far, state officials have been unwilling to do this. They are getting pressure from Governor Thompson of Illinois, who will fight any increased diversion which might cause flooding in downstate Illinois. That leaves Lakeshore residents with very few alternatives, none of which are easy. In our next report, we'll look at the untold damage being caused by these high lake levels and who might be responsible. I'm George Lessons, TV 13 Eyewitness News.